Hello, Data Standard community. I'm your host, Shana Weldon, and this is the Data Standard Audio Experience. We have a very exciting guest today. Today, we have Pierce Freeman, a Senior Director of Machine Learning at Globality. Globality is revolutionizing the way companies buy and sell services with smart sourcing, which is powered by artificial intelligence. Pierce has spent the past four years at the intersection of product development and machine learning. So welcome to the show. Happy to be here. We're happy to have Shana. you. Welcome. We're extremely happy to have you. So to start off, can you please just go ahead and introduce yourself? Yeah, absolutely. Well, like you mentioned, I'm Pierce. I'm the uh, head of machine learning over at Globality. So I oversee a team of data scientists, machine learning researchers, and engineers who are all plugging along on our various business challenges to introduce AI into the world of professional services. Before that, I was in academia for uh, quite a few years doing research into the intersection of computer vision and natural language processing. So my research specifically looked at doing automatic carotid artery diagnosis in radiology. So it was um, looking at how to use multimodality. So combining text in electronic medical records with images of the actual radiology scans themselves to try to detect if you had an abnormal or a normal carotid artery, abnormal being if there was plaque buildup uh, within that artery, such that it could be deployed to uh, developing countries that don't have the same kind of radiology capacity as we do stateside or in other Western countries. So I uh, transitioned over to the industry side about four and a half years ago at this point for globality, and I've been loving it ever since. Wow, that is quite an impressive background. So what exactly do you do at Globality? You know, it's really interdisciplinary. So in my particular position, I sit at the intersection of product engineering, machine learning, and our subject matter experts, all to solve the problems that we have in terms of data science and matching capabilities. At the end of the day, I, I really think of myself as a product builder. That's what I've always loved. That's what I did prior to getting into industry and academic researcher. So I think of machine learning as a key part in our toolkit to solve complex problems and meet users where they are today, which tends to be huge humans wanting to interact with computers in a more natural medium. And what we do specifically at the company is we create a marketplace that partners some of the world's largest companies on the demand side of the ecosystem with their professional supplier base on the supply side. So you think of you know, McKinsey, BCG, Accenture, Infosys, probably some of the bigger names. There are tens of thousands of smaller and bigger suppliers worldwide that can do professional services across marketing, management, consulting, IT, HR, legal. If you name it, there's probably some company out there that can do it. <laughs> so what we do is we build the interchange mechanism in the middle of that transaction to partner the demand side with the most relevant suppliers given some project that they have. So when we're trying to scope what that project looks like with uh, client users that work for these you know, Fortune 50, Fortune 500s, they come to us with some need and they say, we're looking for a product launch in Brazil in six months, right? They're looking for a goal. They want their product to be launched and launched successfully. We need to meet them where they are. And in so doing, we need to translate that rich text that they've given us into something that's more machine interpretable, such that we can then match it with that supplier base on the supply side in order to find the ones that are most relevant for that given transaction. So it's um, much like you would interact with a search system or some uh, product recommendation engine. We're trying to recommend that supplier set to the client base. And as part of that, that itself is in a lot of ways a machine learning challenge. It's how to model via natural language processing what the clients are looking for, how to model provider capabilities based on what they've published online, public records, private databases, info that they give us specifically. And then how do you link those two language modalities into some centralized recommendation engine in order to figure out how to partner them with a the client for a specific intent. So a lot of what our team does and what I help drive is doing the modeling, semantic embeddings, recommendation engines that facilitate that comments to happen. Wow. Okay. 
I think what we would love to hear is how you got involved in this field. Really goes back to the start, first startup that I helped co-found. So I was uh, working for a sporting analytics company. It's called Sportsboard, and it was focused on bringing digitization to the process of scouting athletes. So if you think of the process of collegiate or professional scouting, they're looking to leagues below them to pull up talent. And back in the day, this was mostly facilitated via paper, pen, and clipboards. So you'd have some scout that would go out to these different combine events nationwide, even worldwide for a professional team. And they're writing down subjective as well as some objective measure of athlete performance at these different combines. They then go back to their laptops, type them in an Excel at the end of the night, and then try to triangulate and then merge multiple spreadsheets with different scouts that were doing that same thing at other venues to come up with some point of view about who they wanted to scout from the leagues below them. So me and my co-founder were looking at this space and thought that this was incredibly suboptimal. And this was right around 2008, 2009 with the release of the iPad. So it seemed like a natural extension of the clipboard to go to a more digital first medium and start working with iPads instead of clipboards. And as part of that process, obviously a lot of core technical challenges to solve there by mobile syncing, low resource, low energy consumption, uh, having to deal with spotty Wi-Fi or zero cell reception. So if you needed to have some redundancy in syncing, ended up getting a lot of data through that process. So those subjective and objective measures of athlete performance, we wanted to make as quantifiable and as measurable as possible. So we got that all in one centralized repository and could start to run analytics on that to try to predict the athletes that would be most capable of slotting into that need for that given scouting team. So that got me into the data world as a whole, wrangling data, dealing with bias, dealing with messy data. And I, uh, when I left that company and then went to get my degree, since that was, uh, that was pre-college when I started that company, I started focusing on data, machine learning, and then the most modern techniques of doing deep learning self-supervision, reinforcement learning as ways of trying to get computers to interact more naturally with humans. And, you know, still very much uh, am, am passionate about that interest and think that it's gonna be a big focus of the next 10, 15, 25 years. It's meeting people where they are and having computers be more expressive in interacting with the world that we've largely built for other human beings. So you need to have computers that are able to interact with the perception systems that people are. And that got me started on this journey, both working globality as well as doing the research to try to, again, have computers help augment human capabilities and do things at scale instantaneously. Hey, you mentioned the passion that you have, and I can hear it in your voice when you're speaking. So what excites you the most about data architecture and from this clipboard to iPad? Yeah, I mean, I think um, you're probably getting at, but I've, I've always really been in this intersection of doing engineering and doing data science. And I think that a lot of people view those as two distinct job titles or opportunity sets. I think that they're very much one and the same. So if you think of the whole process of collecting, aggregating, synthesizing data, and then doing data analytics on top of it, that's solving for a pain point, that's solving for one element of the process within a larger organization. And that's the product that you're building. As machine learning researchers, at least in the industrial sense, what we care about is deploying some end product that's smart, that interacts with users, um, and that builds off of data capabilities in order to do something valuable. So specific to your question about you know, data architecture or uh, machine learning and how it interacts, I think that it's a vastly under-emphasized, under-invested area of the overall stack. People are very focused on doing you know, the engineering things within the platform design, and then a lot on the machine learning side of building the models, interacting with data sets, and trying to come up with some intelligent algorithm. The plumbing that's in the middle, I actually think is incredibly exciting because it has such a high yield on the productivity of data scientists and the ability for a company to continue to learn, evolve, and then leverage the data stream that they have access to to great use in some intelligent implementation of a feature. So 
I think that that's incredibly exciting and operating at that nexus of engineering product and data science allows you to start to pattern match how these different opportunities can impact and then help one another. And I think that that is one of the very core synergies that you can find within the two organizational sets. Wow. What are some differences that you observed between in the industry and in academia? There's a lot. I mean, I think one of the biggest things is how permanent companies are. So if you think of research as an endeavor, the end goal of research is to publish. And there are a lot of qualifications on publishing. You need to publish something that's reliable, is true, is vetted, peer reviewed as much as possible. And you have a moment where people are starting to move to open sourcing their, uh, their research as software packages, which I think is a great trend since it allows for some reproducibility of research. But writ large, the end goal is static in academia. You get to a paper publication. If you're lucky, you get accepted into a top tier conference. You give a presentation and you're done. People will take what you did, extend it. That maybe uh, lays the foundation for future work that other people will do to push the field forward. But that was your contribution. It was very time limited and there was a clear end goal that you got to hell or high water in order to publish your publication. Industry is not like that. Companies, especially robust, sustainable ones, are going to be around for a really long time. And when you're thinking about technological practices, you have to think of doing things that are built right and that can scale, at least in my mind, to one order of magnitude from where you are. So if you take your current user growth and traction, you have to extrapolate out to at least one order of magnitude more than you have now for that system to, in my mind, be a robust and flexible system. And you can come back to it in the future. Um, so you can always refactor, decompose, choose different architectures. But your code very well might live on for years and years if you don't get to those kind of scaling bottlenecks, right? People come and go, employees leave, there's churn. Your thing might be in a system that long exceeds your tenure with the company. It's really important to build it right. And I always think that people are surprised when they see how long some little code snippet that was largely duct tape ends up in some production system. It's one of those things where if it ain't broke, people aren't gonna fix it. And even if it is broke, but broke a little, people still might not fix it. So the emphasis really has to be on doing things that are scalable and doing things well in industry because that code very well might live on for years and years. And uh, you really have to think about that. Know the ramifications if you're going to do a shortcut recognize what that shortcut is, what kind of impacts does it have on the bottom line of the scalability, and ensure it's going to be stable and it's going to scale at least for the, uh, for the near future. So that's one big difference. Another big one, I think just comes back to the definition itself, right? Where AI is scoped to be so broad in academia. At the end of the day, it's really just a department or a field of research within some computer science department or at some places like MIT, I think it is its own department now as a whole. It includes a ton of disparate research directions. Everything from information retrieval and search systems, self-supervision, reinforcement learning, even some algorithms like beam search tend to kind of be under this AI umbrella because it's very probabilistic and tends to be used in a lot of these systems. I think that has muddied the waters writ large for what we consider to be AI versus what we don't. And industry has looked at this definition and I think overly labels technologies as AI because it provides good marketing traction and good fodder to label things as cutting edge, novel, and it's not wrong. There's no way you can really take that definition to the bank and assess the validity, true or false, is this technology AI, when the definition that we're going off of in academia is itself so fuzzy. So I think in some sense, ourselves as academics have done a disservice to the broader conversation around AI by casting the net so wide that we, uh, we don't really know what AI is and, and what it's not. Reminds me of that quote from The Incredibles. I don't know if you've watched it. It's like the, uh, if everyone's super, no one is. 
that's yeah. kind of what AI is now. It's like if everything is AI, nothing's AI, and that's no longer a useful moniker to refer to it. So it's something that I've been pushing for a lot recently is a clearer industry working definition of AI versus machine learning. So I break it down like this. Machine learning is something very clear that I think we can agree upon. It's you have a system that looks at data, pattern recognizes, and then comes out with some output, right? So you, as the model builder, give the model configurations in the middle. You say what architecture it should accomplish, and you give it an input and an output contract in the case of semi or full supervision. It's a little bit different self-supervision. But you have that contract really clear, and then some optimizer is in charge of getting that architecture to have the right weights to best fit to the data that you give it access to to fulfill that input-output contract. Everyone who's in the space can look at a system and say, this involves machine learning or this doesn't because it's a really clear definition. AI, I would say, would be systems that integrate multiple machine learning systems, so probabilistic models of the world, with some logical rules that sit on top of them, right? So either some deterministic rule sets, some if-then statements, or even just some basic numerical probability number crunching, or that fuse multiple machine learning models into some aggregate model, I think then you're on firmer ground to call that AI. Because that's drawing a clear line and, and a distinct viewpoint from machine learning just be the base of the model that learns to the AI that fuses things together and that integrates multiple machine learning models from different places. And that anecdotally at least brings my experience in industry in a really clear definition where in industry you have models and you have systems that use those models. We tend to call those systems AI appropriately so, but separates it a little bit from machine learning itself. Yeah, I think it's great you focused on actually defining AI. The term is thrown around a lot, AI and ML. And I think this new workable definition that you have is really great. So putting machine learning to practical use can be difficult. So what can people do to bring ML data into practice? Yeah, there's a whole strategy around it and this occupies yeah. most of my time. So I think every company is going to be a little bit different in practice. And I think that that's why it's important to build out a machine learning organization and function within the company that can have these conversations. But at a broad level, let's say you're starting off you are not yet at the scale or the place where you really want to spin up a machine learning function. What can you do to set yourself up on the best foot going forward to have machine learning and to have intelligent systems and interactions in the future? I'd say capture as much data as you're going to be able to get. Data is one of those things where it's like an integral over time. The full data that you have at the end of the day is going to be the area under the curve or the integral of you know each day, the data that you collect spread out across all of the years or months that you're going to collect that data. So over instrument, over capture data, and the more that you're going to be able to do with it in the future. I certainly know of some cases where companies have underemphasized a lot of that data capture. You think back to the early days of MySpace, right? Where they were still hashing out with Facebook to see what would be a leading social network. Facebook was structured in its format. Every profile looked the same. You had fields that you would fill out. So we'd be able to say, my profile first and last is gonna be Pierce Freeman, went to Stanford, that's my education. Um, and you can go through the metadata of these people in a very structured database-like format. MySpace on the other hand, was all custom pages for the most part. So you could customize them, you could tweak them, you could style them. Was it really as templated into some common profile? And then you project that out three, four years when Facebook and MySpace are considering introducing more features like news feed, status updates, et cetera. Facebook has a very clear and well-organized structured model of what people are like, how they interact with other people within the larger social graph. MySpace didn't really have access to that. And if I think of what ended up sealing the deal for Facebook as one of the most profitable companies, I think of that choice early on. It, they set themselves up to collect both a large amount of data at any one time step, as well as let that funnel run for long enough so they could make this really detailed social network. And the aggregate result of that is much better targeting, 
much higher quality and more accurate machine learning models and being able to leverage that going forward. So for any company that finds himself in a position where there is some data being thrown off, there are some user interactions that are happening on the platform, capture as much as you can and then figure out what to do with it later. And only at the point where you're so saturated with data, you're running up your S3 bills, your Hadoop clusters are filling up with all these logs, then maybe consider turning off the spigot. But by and large, it's much worse and I think much more common to not have instrumented these data capture pipelines. And it's better to overdo it than underdo it. Okay, so those who are listening have heard it here. Why Facebook has prevailed and the importance of capturing data. Moving from capturing to producing data, how do you produce data pipelines to the consumer? We're big fans of Airflow. I think you have to find a stack that works for uh, you as an organization, works for your scale. There are a lot of different options now. So do your due diligence and, and they're all different in unique ways. I think the few you know framework or structure that you should think about when you're trying to think through producing data pipeline is making sure that it's scalable to some number of batch nodes. So once you write code, this will allow you to more or less linearly scale what you're doing and the processing that you're doing to, again, that order of magnitude or maybe even two orders of magnitude worth of growth. Most of the cutting edge solutions to this let you do it. Um, you know, Spark, Hadoop, Airflow, they let you uh, issue tasks onto some cluster that you can configure the size of. And if you have more data, scale up that cluster. If you have less, you scale it down. Um, so having the code as much as possible, try to remain transient to the underlying data flows, I think is what you should strive for in a pipeline like that. And one of the reasons why we like Airflow is because you organize it as a, as a DAG. So a directed acyclic graph, it's basically a uh, pointer to the amount of dependencies that you have that can happen before other ones. So if you're dependent on some previous step, you have to wait for that step to be done, obviously. Whereas if you're not dependent on it and you can make progress in parallel, you should do that so that the entire uh, job uh, takes a shorter amount of time. Airflow lets you do that in a, in a pretty nice abstraction layer. So we're pretty big fans of it. But I think uh, as long as you find yourself something that works and that requires as little infrastructure support as you can, I think you're well on your way to creating a successful data pipeline. So what is the biggest challenge in your field? I think, I mean, there are a lot, uh, which I think is why it's such an exciting time to be a machine learning practitioner and to do research. There are a lot of really big, beefy, exciting challenges. One of the biggest ones I think in practice tends to be data availability. Most of the research coming out of big organizations that are private, you think Google, Facebook, Microsoft, have access to a lot of data and billions of data points that they can learn on and they end up getting very precise machine learning models because of it. I think most of the impactful problems that happen day to day tend to be very low data. Even if you think of you know, the case of self-driving cars, for 99.9% .9 of situations, driving tends to be pretty vanilla. It's, it's a road, other cars are behaving themselves. You can see the dividing line appropriately. It's when you get to the fraction, that long tail of edge cases that you start running into problems. It's things that the systems haven't seen before. Uh, you don't have lane markers anymore. You have uh, the moon coming out looking like a traffic light, all these things which actually happened a couple of weeks ago. All these things end up being part of this long tail distribution where you don't have that much data. So I think the biggest challenge of machine learning is starting to become doing research into these zero shot or few shot learning situations um, where hopefully you can learn from some large enough data set to have your system start to build a deeper intuition about the world and about its internal model, such that if you get to a position where you don't have that much data or you're in one of these long tail situations, the machine behaves more or less like a human would in that situation, follow our intuition, and therefore, um, help solve the problem, even if you don't have the kind of billions of standardized data scale that we can see at uh, some of these larger companies. Well, I appreciate your insights so much, and I'm sure everyone who's listening does as well. And for more information on the data standard, you can find us at www.datastandard.io. This episode was sponsored by Pandio, and they're innovating the tech space. You can learn more about their work at pandio.com. 
Well, thanks again, Pierce, for being here. And where can people find you? You can find me on my website, piercefreeman.com, uh, LinkedIn as well. Uh, I'm not much of a, uh, a tweeter, but I am on Twitter. Uh, <laughs> would love to uh, have people reach out and continue the conversation. Sounds great. Thank you so much again for taking the time. Likewise. Likewise.